This podcast is brought to you by North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives. This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Thank you for watching this week's NC Spin. It's been a particularly busy week. Wednesday's rally in Raleigh brought thousands of red-shirted teachers to the Capitol, and there were supporters and opponents of this event. We'll let you hear both sides. Our state house rolled out their proposed budget for the next two years Monday night, and we're going to discuss some of those budget highlights. Then we dissect what happened in Tuesday's special congressional primary election in the 3rd District. And, of course, as always, we ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. Speaking of which, this week's panel includes Bev Perdue, former governor of North Carolina, John Hood, syndicated columnist and author, Chris Fitzsimon, director of the newsroom, and Leo Daughtry, former legislator and current member of the UNC Board of Governors. Well, we've got a full show, and we're going to begin our uninterrupted debate after these brief messages from our underwriters. Finding a North Carolina solution for covering the uninsured will reduce all our health care costs and lead to a healthier North Carolina. Let's find a solution for covering the uninsured. Visit careforcarolina.com. From treating the newest member of your family to helping a loved one make end-of-life decisions, your family physician is with you every step, for every stage of life, for every member of your family. Despite a healthcare landscape fraught with potential landmines, family physicians across North Carolina are providing you a lifetime of committed, dependable medical care. Family Physicians, your trusted healthcare advisor for life. Partners for Innovation in Healthcare. We're supporting common sense solutions for North Carolina's healthcare delivery system, promoting access, affordability, quality care, and innovation. Visit us on the web at pihc.info. Life's busy, but you're in control. As an electric cooperative member, you have access to lots of tools to help manage your home energy use and budget, so you can focus on what's most important. Our state has more than 300,000 with no options for health insurance. 63% are in working families, one illness away from disaster. Let's create a North Carolina solution for covering the uninsured. To learn more, visit careforcarolina.com. NC Span is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. Let's get started. Spurred by a successful effort last year, as well as teacher rallies and strikes in other states, red-shirted teachers swarmed into Raleigh on Wednesday in support of more funding for education. Some 34 of the state's 115 school systems were closed because so many teachers had requested personal leave. There were thousands present at the rally, but the event also drew some criticism because it interrupted teaching in our public schools. Beth Purdue, whether accurate or not, uh, last year's rally was credited with getting teachers larger pay increases and some say was responsible for big gains in the 2018 elections for Democrats. Is it too early to determine what kind of impact Wednesday's rally had? I've talked to some people all over the state and I believe that the rally was toned differently. The teachers and support people who came talk more about the kids and that's what they should have done. They talked about the salaries, the support personnel, all the other pieces of the educational system that are so important, but they didn't focus on salary increases for teacher. I think that's a good point, and I believe they were heard. I mean, I really do believe that it makes a difference. Sure were a flood of them in downtown Raleigh, so far as it goes, but Leo, they drew some criticism from the standpoint of, one guy said, this is just nothing but a political rally for Democrats. Well, I think that's right. You do? Yeah. I, I really think that last year uh, they made a good point. They came. They said we, we were being neglected. I think the uh, legislator, heard, legislator, heard, legislator heard them. But this year, it seems to me it didn't serve a purpose other than a political purpose. So I was, I was disappointed in the rhetoric. I know they had Reverend Barber talking about teach them a lesson. And it was just, to me, a real political a fiasco. Well, let's move into some of the demands that they were talking about because one of the things that they were um, 
particularly highlighting was trying to bring counselors, nurses, librarians, social workers, psychologists up to nationally recognized uh, standards so far as numbers were concerned. Uh, Senate President Pro Tem Phil Berger, uh, Berger took issue with them, uh, first of all, about what are nationally recognized standards, but he said, hey, we've already got more counselors and librarians than the national average. Was it worth picking a fight with Berger over this? <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm not sure the answer to that question is anything other than yes, because this is an issue that both sides would like to engage on. Uh, you could always make an argument for more funding for counselors and nurses and other uh, personnel who are in the schools who are maybe not, not, maybe not teachers but are delivering important service. But Senator Berger also made an appropriate point. North Carolina is very high in by national standards when it comes to those proportions. Particularly counselors and librarians. Yeah. I mean, it's, in, it's, in the psychologist it, business, the biggest problem there is the availability. It just aren't psychologists available. Well, the, it is a fair point to say that labor markets are based on price, so if, if the salary was higher, you might end up with more people willing to do that particular job. Chris, it's, it's difficult uh, <coughs> estimating crowd size. I know everybody was trying to say, was it more teachers than last year, the same or less? Uh, then we had this bizarre episode that took place on Thursday in which the head of NCAE posted a crowd shot uh, which later the media and others came back and said was doctored. Mm -hmm. Did this hurt NCAE's credibility? Um, I mean, it wasn't wise to post it. I don't know where he got it. I don't know what hap how it happened, but I don't think it overshadows the day. We had thousands of teachers. I don't know how many thousand. We could talk, there's been a, a, a large uh, discrepancy in what the numbers were. There was a mini controversy about the picture. The point was there are thousands, tens of thousands of people who came to Raleigh to support public education. You can call it a fiasco, you can call, you can object to Reverend Barber speaking at the end. I don't, but I think people can. The idea is now we have a day in some way set aside to talk about how much we need to invest in public schools. We're still investing less per capita on education than we were before the Great Recession. We still do have shortages all over the place. We have a teacher pay raise which starts in January after we were yeah, had a talk about that. Well, but that's important. Okay. I mean, the, the, I, here's the whole, the fundamental thing is whether you believe them or not, the teachers and a lot of people who support public schools believe that the last several years under Republican rule has not been favorable to educators, to public schools especially, because they've done all these other things, some of which they're now starting to correct, which is interesting because it means, oh, well, maybe we made a mistake, whether it's the school grading system, whether it's support for counselors, school nurses, whether it's uh, unbridled vouchers, which we haven't even talked about, where we have no restrictions at all. There is a perception among the education, public education community that these folks haven't been supportive, and that's what this is all about. So far as it goes, the, the, let's talk about some of these issues. Uh, one of the other demands, uh, Bev, was that they wanted uh, to demand $15 an hour minimum wage for support personnel uh, who work there. Any chance that's going to happen? I don't think it's going to happen, but I think the point was valid. I talked to a teacher's assistant down there on Wednesday, and she said she had worked as an assistant for 15 years and was driving a bus and needed another part-time job. She is still below minimum wage. Her two kids can be on free and reduced lunch. Mm. That's wrong in North Carolina. We're better than that. I don't think you can have enough nurses and counselors that saved children's lives. This is just a discussion that the current leadership has not been good enough on. They've moved the salaries up. I'm tickled with that. But there needs to be an opportunity but to look at But these are the same them. discussions we've been having for the last 20 some years right. on NC Spin, right? right? I mean, they're pretty much. I don't know. The same. We were close to the national average one time. At one uh, point, there's so no we're question. Clo we're close now. All right, so let's keep going. <laughs> All right, let, let's move to. Since we're being dragged into this teacher pay uh, situation, let's talk about this. The House budget is going to increase teacher pay by 4.6 percent for those teachers who have over 15 years of teaching experience. Now, in the past, they raised the entry-level teaching wages to $35,000. Uh, Speaker Tim Moore says that the teacher is not going to get up to $55,000 average across the board. What do you think about putting the emphasis on the teachers who have had more time in the classroom? Well, I think that was a complaint a few years ago that the money was going to the, the early teachers, the young teachers, and none was going to the more experienced teachers, and I think this is an attempt 
to balance that out, and I think it's a good thing. Is to it do. going to is it going to slow down the teacher shortage, the the retirements and the leavings and the transfers? Because we have a teacher shortage in North Carolina. Yeah. Will boosting this pay for uh, teachers with longer tenure will that help slow that down any bit? It'll attract people to be teachers, but the longevity issue is the reason that so many people are retiring. Folks, if my generation and younger are just simply ready to get out. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anything can stop that, nor John, do we want it. Help me with this. Uh, Chris alluded to it. This teacher pay rate doesn't take place until January. Doesn't start Correct. until January. Now, the legislature said it was because of availability. What does that mean? The state doesn't have the money? That's correct. That's what they mean is revenue availability. So has the case got, has the state got a case of the shorts, so to speak? Well, not to get too much into the broader <laughs> budget discussion, but the House budget is fairly tight. Uh, it's tight because revenue is not a very strong number right now. In fact, revenue, general fund revenue through all the first three quarters of the fiscal year is a little below projections. Is not much, right? but a little yeah. below. Uh, so the, the, what they were doing was a larger number put in halfway through the year rather than a smaller number that starts in July. I got Interesting it. that that wasn't part of the press conference, however, when they, announced, when they were yeah, talking about the I got that. It, was not, it was not explained. They, they, the context they, was lacking. Yeah. Also, they had originally said really the average was 4.8 and it was really 4.6. Right. Let's talk about the other side of this, though, because state employees <laughs> got 1% or $500, whichever also is greater. Also starting up with you. And they were, yeah, they were incensed about all of this. Do you think this is going to result in perhaps us seeing state employees rallies on the mall I, I, don't, I don't know, but I think it's shocking when we hear about how great the economy is from our uh, president and uh, everybody in North Carolina on both sides. Unemployment is low. Things are going well. Everybody's turned the state around. And last year was a great year. They got 2%. This year they're getting 1%, which I think is actually an insult. And I, I think it's really important before we keep talking about the budget, the availability and all these numbers. We cut taxes $3.6 billion a year. Millionaires got more than a $20,000 a year cut, uh, tax cut every year. That's why we don't have any money to pay folks. Well, I think we have money. We have, this is a 3% increase over last year. The budget itself. Yeah. 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 And I don't know that that's a bad thing to spend 3% more money this year than you spent last year. But, Leo, the legislature wants to prevent future rallies like this from taking place again. They obviously were not amused by all of this. There's a proposal now that a teacher can only get authorized leave if... Uh, she, and most of them are, if she has a creditable substitute to take her place. Could that, you're a lawyer, is that going to stand up in court? I, I don't know about the legal perspe uh, perspective, but I do think that the rally may have backfired on the teachers. Interesting. Interesting. Well, most of what the teachers and educa educators wanted to discuss involved the budget, so it's probably a good time for us to transition over to that. This year was the House's turn to present the budget. Lawmakers did so Monday night. The first general fund spending plan was for $23.9 billion, a 3% increase over the current fiscal year. And after passage by the House uh, late this week, uh, the budget goes to the Senate uh, for uh, their approval. I want to talk uh, though and get into the, the real question uh, about all of this so far as the budget was concerned. Um, likely going to be a conference committee. I don't think there's any question uh, that it's going to be a, go a conference committee. The budget was narrowly passed. Uh, it, it, it had a very narrow margin. Three hours of debate on the floor. Uh, 34 amendments, none of which passed, uh, mostly from Democrats. Uh, Cooper panned this budget. Does that mean he's going to veto it? Uh, I think it's likely that the governor will veto ultimately the budget. Remember, he's not going to veto the House budget because this is just the first step. The Senate's going to come in with a budget. I suspect they will have a higher pay raise for state employees, maybe some other changes. Then the two sides will negotiate a compromise. Then that budget will go to the governor. I assume he will veto because it's not going to have Medicaid but expansion. Beth, right? Okay, so this is the first year since 2011 that the uh, with a Democrat in office in the in the uh, mansion and the Republican legislature, he doesn't have veto-proof majorities in either the House or the Senate. Uh, so if he vetoed it, could it stand? I like the message being sent yesterday to fellow Democrats. Uh, if you veto, if you vote for the budget, and this is a message about any piece of legislation, we're going to run somebody against you and we're going to 
stand you up. So wow. it was strong and powerful. There are organizations out there that can do what they're saying. And I would think that Republicans and Democrats would be wary about voting this against their like party. It sounds like the Washingtonization of politics in Raleigh. Doesn't I it? hate it. A funny thing about all that, here is an opportunity for the words bipartisan and compromise to be used. I mean, I don't know why the governor and the members of the House and Senate leadership couldn't sit down and try to work out some kind of compromise. I don't but it's, th it's fairly, fairly obvious they haven't. Well, no, they it's could. Too early. It's, they it's too early. It's too early. They will yeah. eventually. You think that when it gets ready to well, go to conference? To. I think it would be great if they did. I haven't seen it happen since 2011. And maybe this is a new beginning. Well, the governor wasn't real happy with this budget. He made it no, no bones about it, particularly because it didn't include his Medicaid expansion. Right. It's also worth noting, going back to the last topic, that the teachers advocated that because they see so many kids in their, in their classrooms whose families don't have health care. I think this will be the big... Uh, I think this will be the fundamental issue. The raises are very important. There'll be arguments about it, but some version of Medicaid expansion, whether it's Medicaid expansion or the Carolina Cares program or the, Repu the Republican program in the House, some expansion of, cover of health care coverage will be a giant sticking point when we get to the final budget. And, and when we get closer to that point, obviously we're going to want to sit down and take a whole show to, to talk right. about it. So to, th this show, we're just going to try to hit some highlights of, of what's going on. Um, so far as it goes, one of those uh, issues is the reduction in franchise taxes for businesses in North Carolina. Leo, you're a businessman. What does that mean? What is a franchise? I don't even know. Well, a franchise tax is a tax you use on a business that's doing a certain thing. And uh, I think John could probably answer that well, better it's, than it's, me. It's, it's really an asset tax rather right. than an income tax. So we, we're used to talking about the corporate income tax. But a franchise tax is not levied on the net income of a business. It's levied on the yeah. value of a business. It could be the the book value. Yeah. It could be the amount of property. It depends on the type of business as to which is the highest of the tax bases. But there is a proposal to in the House budget, and I think the Senate on this one probably will go along to reduce that franchise tax by a fairly small amount in the first year, but, but in the, the second year it gets a, 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 a larger and, number. And Leo, probably like you as a small businessman, I've been paying that for a long time and haven't fully understood exactly yeah. what it was. Now they're going to try to offset that uh, by increasing sales taxes, particularly to the people, uh, Chris, that are, that are selling uh, over the internet. Uh, and that should come close to offsetting the yeah. franchise We'll price. see, although it does get into that sticky wicket of internet sales taxes, which we've talked about on the show many times before. It's very, that's very complicated. Shouldn't and the other be. point on the taxes real quick is that the biggest tax item is actually a premium tax on these new Medicaid private contract plans. It's not really a new tax, it's just the premium tax being applied. But that means if you look at the way the budget is set up, we're going to have more tax revenue because of this budget than before. It's not technically a tax increase budget, but this is not a budget. The House budget does not reduce the tax burden over, overall. It actually, there's a slight increase. Interesting. And we've still got a shortage of funding. Well, because the revenue is the revenue is roughly on target. There's a lot of demands on the budget. The Medicaid rebase wasn't a zero. It was a pretty large number. Yeah. On the other hand, we don't have much enrollment growth in our uh, various uh, I was education say, we, programs. Yeah. So far as it, it goes, the uh, education enrollment number, the education numbers, total education spending is going to be 14 billion dollars out of okay. out of a 32 billion dollar budget, we're still spending a tremendous amount of our uh, tax dollars on education. Well, you should be. You've got kids in pre-K, the K through 12, the uh, vouchers, and the post-secondary. And now the emphasis is on workforce uh, development, where you also are being encouraged to give stipends to those kids who are, or adults, 50 and 60, who are in second career preparation. And another big spending. issue is, th another big part of the budget, I didn't mean That's to interrupt right. you, but I just want to point out, remember last year when we raised the age for juvenile jurisdiction? Yeah. Uh, yes. Right. Okay, there are tens of millions of dollars in this budget to implement that right. because it is going to be systems. somewhat more costly yeah. to handle some of these well, offenders in the juvenile system. Justice and public safety was one thing I was very interested in. And we always wanted to raise the age, but the cost is almost prohibitive. $70 million for this biennium. Wow. Interesting. That's, that's going to be very why, why expensive. Why is that, Leo? You've got to hire all these people. You have it's to expand the juvenile justice system. Yeah. In fact. To handle some of these offenders in the juvenile Which system. Which is probably the reason why we hadn't done it before now. We, we couldn't afford it. That's yeah. exactly right. Um, 
but it's right. important to get them out because they don't belong in the adult system. Well, That's right. yeah, we just make professional criminals. We did. <laughs> yeah, we exactly did. Exactly what's happening there. Now, speaking of which, our security guards in our prison are going to get uh, at least five percent increases. They were being paid. Uh, horribly low wages considering the amount of risk that they were taking. You're exactly right. It's a good and start. It's not enough, but I agree. It's a very good start. We needed to do that. And principals are getting a raise. Uh, yes, they're getting principals a 10 percent. Principals and security guards. <laughs> yeah. You know, what was it, last week, week before last, Howard Lee, who obviously, like you, is a big education advocate, said, you know, I, I, he's changing his thinking to believing that the principal may be the most important person uh, in, in these schools. Um, okay. Uh, no Medicaid expansion, but as you say, there is uh, additional money that is being spent mm -hmm. on behalf of DHHSS. For uh, Medicaid transformation, essentially the, the managed care movement in Medicaid, which is, I mean, as I said earlier, that this looks like, some of it looks like an increase in taxes, really just shifting the money from an expenditure to the Medicaid account to money going out to private plans and a little bit of it coming back into tax revenue. We will obviously be talking about this after the Senate uh, makes their changes and approve them. But special springtime elections rarely turn out large numbers of voters. In Tuesday's special third district congressional election, 14 and a half percent of the registered voters showed up. And in the field of candidates shrunk from 26, almost enough for three baseball teams, down to five. Democrat Alan Thomas won outright the Democratic nomination, while two doctors, Dr. Greg Murphy from Greenville and Dr. Joan Perry from Kenston, are going to face off in a runoff. I want to get our panel's reactions to all of this. Uh, got about three minutes uh, for this segment, but let's start off by saying what was your takeaway from Tuesday's election? Well, there were a lot of people. I think last week we talked about how there were five or six credible candidates. These were two clearly two of them in the Republican primary, a, a well-known uh, doctor who's a member of the General Assembly, another doctor who's very powerful in the uh, 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 anti-abortion movement. Perry, John Perry, right, right. Your takeaway? I, I think that name ID carried the day because you had two people. Greg Murphy is known very well in Greenville and Pitt County and then Joan Perry's family has been in Republican politics for many, many years. But there were several legislators and they, they didn't all, do but, all that well. Well, they didn't, they didn't spend any money. Yeah. yeah, all right. right. Bev, your takeaway. This is your home district. It is my home district. 14% of the people voted. I thought there were more cats and dogs around than voters. <laughs> it's really tragic. Uh, my takeaway is that name recognition did win. You have Alan Thomas, who was a wonderful mayor of Greenville, coming in. And again, it speaks to the, the name recognition. John? Uh, I understand that 14.5% isn't very impressive. It's about average. I mean, this is what the, this is what the primary turnout was last year in mm -hmm. an a, uh, even-numbered year for a congressional primary. Uh, you might want it to be whore. It was certainly not low by historical standards. I thought it was fairly interesting because all of the Republican candidates were big Trump supporters. Mm -hmm. Probably the most two moderate candidates in the election were the one that came in first and second. And I thought that well, I don't was, think they'd agree with you. They are more moderate than well, the rest not, of them not, were. Not, Some not of them abortion were. issues, not for not example. Like issues. Joan Perry's very conservative. Well, I, now, I, so I far suspect as, you'll see them move into the middle when, when the time comes. Right? general right. election, but so far as it goes, I understand we're getting ready to have tons of money dumped into independent expenditures on support of all of these candidates. Um, any particular idea of what might happen in this the, runoff? The, both of the candidates won or came in second in nine out of the, the counties of that district. So their, their, their support was not just in one county. All right. Uh, before we run out of time in the show, I want to start by asking each of you to tell us something we don't know. And Chris, I'll start again with you. One of my favorite comments of the legislature this past week, they were debating whether or not to ban wind farms in North Carolina. Senator Harry Brown said uh, uh, in, when they did it in New York, it closed a military base in the mid-90s. The first wind farm in New York wasn't until the year 2000. All right. Leo. You, you know, uh, there was a lot of people 20 years ago who were so worried about the drug trafficking and people using drugs, particularly young people, that the prosecutor would load up the charges against that person and they would plead guilty to a felony. And recently there seems to be a movement of Away maybe, from that. <laughs> maybe, maybe to give some of those people who were uh, convicted a second chance. All right. Bev Purdue, tell us something we don't know. You may know it, but I was still surprised. On the same day last week, the state of Florida passed a carried 
concealed weapons permission for school teachers. Now, I'm not taking a side. Right. I'm just sitting today. And right. then Maine uh, passed a don't use Sorry, plastic. Sorry, I'm running out of time. John, very Ninth quickly. district Republican primary, Dan Bishop, latest poll has him at 31%. If that sticks, he would win without a runoff. Wow. wow. Well, you've heard our spin on this very full show. Thank you for watching and listening to us to stay informed all during the week. Be sure to go to our website, ncspin.com. And as we always tell you at the end of every week, be sure to stay informed and watch out for the spin. Finding a North Carolina solution for covering the uninsured will reduce all our health care costs and lead to a healthier North Carolina. Let's find a solution for covering the uninsured. Visit careforcarolina.com. From treating the newest member of your family to helping a loved one make end-of-life decisions, your family physician is with you every step, for every stage of life, for every member of your family. Despite a healthcare landscape fraught with potential landmines, family physicians across North Carolina are providing you a lifetime of committed, dependable medical care. Family Physicians, your trusted healthcare advisor for life. Partners for Innovation in Healthcare. We're supporting common sense solutions for North Carolina's healthcare delivery system, promoting access, affordability, quality care, and innovation. Visit us on the web at pihc.info. Life's busy, but you're in control. As an electric cooperative member, you have access to lots of tools to help manage your home energy use and budget, so you can focus on what's most important. Our state has more than 300,000 with no options for health insurance. 63% are in working families, one illness away from disaster. Let's create a North Carolina solution for covering the uninsured. To learn more, visit careforcarolina.com. NC Spin is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNCTV network.